Um, in this section, we're going to talk about fluids in general. We have to define them. We're going to talk about a liquid and a gas. We'll talk about what's called a buoyant force, which you know already, believe it or not, because you exhibit it every day um, in, in air, not even in water or fluid, or not even liquid. We'll talk about when objects float, pressure exerted on an object, uh, hydraulic pressure. For example, when you turn your steering wheel, how is that possible, right? It's kind of crazy to think about it. The effort it would actually take to rotate tires on the ground is incredible. Like, think about for a second, right? Imagine if you push down on this calculator with a thousand pounds of force, and for some reason, for some reason it didn't break. It had enough strength to, break, to not break. Do you think while pushing down with a thousand pounds of force, you'd be able to turn this? As you push down, what, what increases when you push down? Normal force, it pushes back up. More normal force means more friction. So if you try to turn something that's made of rubber, or has rubber grippers, or a tire like rubber, that has a thousand pounds of force acting on it, it's almost impossible. You can't do it with human force. So when you turn the steering wheel, how come you're allowed to turn it? What's it called? Why can you turn a steering wheel? What allows you to? And sometimes you can lose this in your car if something goes out, you'd say. Steering wheel fluid? Yeah, power steering, which involves steering wheel fluid. And the fluid is actually what allows you, it transmits what's called hydraulic pressure, or a force, to the tires, which allows you to turn that. If anybody's power steering has ever gone out before when they're driving, and I, I've been in a car that has, I wasn't driving though. My dad was driving, I remember. You suddenly are unable to turn the wheel without a lot of force. I mean, you can get it to rotate maybe five degrees. Like, if you want to turn the car, you need to rotate the wheel almost 360 degrees as you're making a turn and then go back, right? And you see people do it with one hand, it's very easy. Yeah, you know, without power steering, without this hydraulic pressure we're gonna talk about, it's impossible to do that. Um, and then we're going to talk about pressure varying with depth. How do you know that that's true? What example can you give me for that? Pressure varies with depth. Uh, ocean. So the deeper you go, the more pressure. If you've ever been scuba diving before, you know about the fact that you have to equalize the pressure. So you have to, I mean, you have scuba tanks on. You usually get trained to do this, but some of them are actually made to adjust automatically. But even simpler than that, the one I think about is if you're in a pool, like even in the backyard, uh, or somewhere where there's a... Uh, a deep end, not the shallow end, it's not deep enough. After like three feet, you're not gonna feel it. But if you go down 10 feet, you naturally feel a little bit of pressure in your ears, okay? And if you're in the pool and you think about that, what's, what's the reason for that? We're gonna talk about that today. It's the water weighing down on you, okay? It literally weighs down on you, but we'll talk about that behind that. Um, we'll start by just quick definitions. So a fluid is not a liquid, they're not the same thing. A lot of students think they hear the word fluid and think of liquid right away. Like, all right, it's the same. It's not. It's a gas or a liquid. But it has to have a flowing state of matter with no fixed shape. Okay, with no fixed shape. That's the definition simply of a fluid. A flowing state of matter with no fixed shape. Now, we specify with liquid and gas. What's the difference? Take a look and read through them and explain to me, explain to me the difference between liquid and gas. It's about fluid. Okay, good. Um, what's an example of it? Again, gases and liquids are all categorized as fluids. It's a subcategory. So the major category is fluid, okay? Anything that is in this category that has a flowing state of matter or no fixed shape is a fluid. That consists of liquids and gases. All gases are fluids. All liquids are fluids. They're both types of fluids. They're categorized. Give me an example. Oh, give me a reason why liquid and gas, what's, what's the difference really between them? Uh, liquid has volume. Give me more than that, not just volume, but a... Blank volume, fill in the, we need a word for that, A. Definite. A what? Definite. Definite or fixed volume. Gases have volume, right? But they just continue to expand, okay? So remember, a fluid takes on the shape of its container, right? A fluid takes on the shape of its container and has a definite volume or a fixed volume, okay? Now a gas does not have a definite volume or shape. Now, I shouldn't say that because things like balloons, those have a shape, right? But the minute you pop the balloon, the object's going to release into the environment. So it really depends on the container itself for the shape for both gas and liquids. Okay, the next slide is kind of ridiculous, and I put this up here because I think it's kind of funny, but when you think about it, it makes sense. Have you ever seen a cat get it? You, if you have a cat, you've seen this before. Cats like to just go into these like small spaces and suddenly like, like how do they fit into that? Or even uh, a mouse can do this too, but a mouse is kind of gross, or we think of a mouse as gross. But they can fit under doors, you know, right? Mice can fit under doors. Their skeletal system is incredible. So a cat technically can be considered a volume because, uh, a liquid because it has a constant volume, 
and it adapts to the actual container it takes. It's not really a liquid, obviously, at all, right? But that's by definition what a liquid is. So a density, we'll start with. What is the definition of density versus mass density? Why do I specify mass density? You've all seen this before. I know that, so I don't have to sit here and go over it. But why am I specifying mass density versus just general density? Uh, density is like a general amount of density and then mass density. So what is density generally then? I mean, yeah, I have a definition up here, but how would you describe generally the word density, not specifically mass density, just density in general? Okay, thickness, I can understand why you're using that word. Eh, but again, that'd be mass density. I'm saying general density we're looking at. It's words in bio you use that could describe this also. I was going to say that it takes up space. Good, but more specifically, yeah, it takes up space, but its density would be what? Why would you give me an example of density? There's another word for it that you use in bio. It has to do with if everything is located in one area, you say it's what? Condensed or concentrated. It's like the concentration level. Think about uh, biology and chemistry. If you were to mix an acid and a base, you would talk about the concentration of the acid, right? You would talk about how much acid is in the actual mixture or the solution before you put them together. Concentration is like um, if all of you were to suddenly gather in the middle of the room, there would be a high concentration of students in a small area, right? That would be a, a high density in that location. The rest of the room would be a very low density of human life or students or whatever you'd say. Um, if we were to take all the desks and literally push them together, you'd say it'd be a, a concentration of them or a high density of them. Mass density specifically talks about a lot of mass in a small volume. What's an example of something with a very, very large mass density that is talked about when it comes to astronomy? When it comes to astronomy. You had Hannah first. Sure, a steel cube is a perfect one, but it, a steel cube would have a very high density, but for astronomy, I'm saying. There's one that we always talk about. Star. A star, more specific. A black hole. So the example of a black hole comes into perfect timing right here. And I've like alluded to this before, and I feel like one or two of you have asked about this before. The idea is that there's so much density that the gravitational field around it is warped so much that even light cannot escape its pull. So it's really about mass density. That's what a black hole is. It's a really, really, really large amount of mass in a very, very, very small volume. In a very small volume. Imagine taking the Earth and squishing everything, including you guys, to a grain of sand. That's the equivalent of what a black hole's density is. Analogous, obviously. It's not the exact same size and everything. But if you were to try to take everything on the Earth and compress it all with enough pressure to a grain of sand, that's how dense a black hole is idealized as, or measured to be. Okay? So mass density is mass over volume. Anybody know the name of the symbol? Have you seen this in chemistry for density, or did you use capital D? Yeah, capital. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's for density. It's, it's called rho, R-H-O. It's written like a lowercase p, but looks like that when you write it. You kind of put like a little loop to it. It's not, it doesn't actually have that extra part from the p. You just kind of make a loop like that. Sometimes it's at like an angle to the side. You'll see professors write it like that. Okay? But the symbol is called rho, R-H-O. It simply means density. And it's usually specifically for mass density. Kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so density, think of concentration. Think of concentration. Um, something that we should talk about real quick is fixed and variable densities. Uh, give me a show of hands of something that you can alter, or tell me something you can alter its density of. What's something in which density you can alter? And think about it before you answer. If you, oh, if you have an answer right away, it's fine. Will, you start with it. Like a container. Like what kind of a container, Will? One that you can open and put stuff inside of. Okay, so you have an empty container. You can suddenly fill it with stuff, close it. Now there's more mass in the same volume. You've increased density, absolutely. Because look, density and mass are directly related, whereas density and volume are indirectly related. Good, what else? Pumping up a ball. Okay, pumping up a ball. Suddenly you're pushing more gas or air molecules into it, so you're actually, depending on if the volume changes much, but over time you're increasing the density. You're adding more molecules and it's a fixed volume in the ball. Depends on what the state started at. I don't this count, you know like raw chicken? Okay, I could, you're, you're stretching it, but I could see that. I could see that, like food in general. Food's density changes. Let's just categorize it as food. 
So if you put cake batter in the oven, it's very dense. But then when it cooks, what happens? Fluffs up, right? Air goes, you see the air pockets? Its density is decreased. So let's just say food in general. Maybe chicken is possible. I never thought about that. <laughs> Who thinks of chicken? That's hysterical. I'm thinking of something like more, more si simpler than this. Something whose container can be changed. So think about that. Yeah, give, me, give me something else. Anything else? Sponge is a great example. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. You add mass to it when you put it under the water. Suddenly the density goes through the roof. Okay? Or you take the sponge and compress it, and suddenly the density also, again, increases because you're making a smaller volume indirectly related. Okay? And it doesn't matter anything. I was thinking in general about like, liquids and gases in general. So liquids and solids, those cannot really be compressed. You would say they're incompressible. If you took, like earlier, who said a steel, a steel cube was your example of something dense. Could you compress a steel cube any further with the like, human hand? No. Maybe if you've seen those, uh, what's that YouTube channel? Hydraulic Press. Have you seen that, the Hydraulic Press YouTube channel before? And you just put stuff on Hydraulic Press and it just crushes anything. It's literally like got millions and millions of views. I don't know how this happens. People are just have nothing to do with their time. It's absurd. Like, they put a bowling ball in there under Hydraulic Press. This thing shatters it, no problem. So anyhow, uh, if you put anything under there, I'm sure it would compress it a little bit. But under normal stress, something that's a liquid or a solid, you would say it's incompressible. But a gas is compressible. And you can see that with any sort of a non-fixed membrane, like uh, a balloon. If you take a balloon and you start to squish it, what'll happen? The shape will distort a little bit, right? It'll, it'll change because you can physically compress that a little bit. Yeah, part of it might bulge, but you are compressing it by a little amount. Somebody didn't hand up to the two of you. No? Well, if you change its state, yes. So when water, water is one of the few, we could talk quickly about this, water is one of the few things when it goes from a state of liquid to solid that actually, anybody know to finish that? Expands, it's one of the few things. Most things from the state of liquids to solids, the molecules get closer, they all increase in density. They compress naturally when the change of temperature occurs. But the hydrogen bond in water Actually, its angle, it becomes more oblique or more obtuse. It actually opens up a little bit more, which increases the volume. Have you ever filled up the ice tray with water? And you go to take ice out and it's like overflowing. You're like, how'd that happen? Or you put something in the freezer that's a certain amount of volume in like a, a, a water bottle. You fill it up to the top. You want to freeze it hypothetically, that's the bottom. It explodes almost. It, it, so if you ever got, when I was a kid, we used to drink like, it was like Minimade. In a, in a frozen can, you put it in the freezer, defrost it, add it to like water, you had like lemonade or anything like that you would make, but it was a frozen like concentrate. And they never fill those to the top because naturally water, which is what it's made of, expands actually when it's frozen. So that's a good example of a variable density and change of state. Okay, changing of state would also vary the density. Um, so the first example is really quite simple. You're given a certain density of a meteorite that's unknown. You're given the mass of the density. Uh, the mass of the meteorite itself determine the volume of the object that it would displace if it was submerged in a tank of water. And let's talk about that second part in a minute. But first, to start, let's just find the volume in general. So we're given the density here. This is one of those simple early questions where it's just a plug and chug. Okay, given the density, given the mass, and the question is find the volume of the displaced fluid if it was submerged in a tank of water. Okay, so we're trying to find the volume of the fluid displaced. Now, if I take, oops, if I take a tank of water like this, and here's the water level, what happens, you guys know this obviously, it's Archimedes principle we'll talk about in a little while, what happens if you drop something in that water? What happens to the water level? It rises, okay? Suddenly the water level comes up to here, when you've dropped this object, whatever it is, maybe it's a rectangular solid, into the actual water, it rises up. So the question says, how much water has been displaced? What is the volume the object would displace? Physically, it's the amount of volume of the water that rises up. So the volume of the fluid displaced is really just asking you for the volume of the object itself. So that's what we're looking for. They're the same thing here. Again, if something is fully submerged, if it's submerged, the volume of fluid displaced equals the volume of the object. This is simply Archimedes' principle. When you get in a bathtub, what happens to the water? It goes up. OK, 
Okay? The water level rises up. If a bigger person gets in a bathtub, the water level rises up further. It's physically about volume, physical volume. Nothing to do with your weight, nothing to do with your mass, it's volume. Okay? So if you take a can versus a two liter bottle and submerge them both under water in two different containers, the one with the two liter bottle would go up further because the volume is more than the can. But the can has higher mass, probably. Okay? Imagine a metal thick can, let's say, for now. The man can, the, the man, can can have a lot of mass, the bottle could have very little mass, but the bottle's volume is much greater, so when they're both submerged, the water level goes up more with the two liter bottle. Okay, so that's what we're looking for in this case. So when something like, let's say, sinks or stays to the top, that's dependent on the volume or weight? It's dependent on the buoyancy, which is a function of the weight and the volume. It's really a function of, I should say, George, the mass and the volume, but since weight is a function of mass, you can say that. Okay, but it's both. It's a great question. We're going to get to that hopefully today, but we'll see. It might, might, not be until, might not be until Wednesday. Tomorrow, I think we're going to do the lab. I was going to do the lab in the second period, but it's a long lab, actually. So it's a competition lab. There's no write-up for it, so I think you guys will like it. It's, it's fun. It's just, it's just a, pretty much an experiment. It's up for you guys to choose. Um, so if I want to find the volume here, I look at my formula. Density equals mass over volume. Move, mass, uh, move density and volume around giving us volume equals mass over density. So again, right, as always, flip-flop these two. Some students in the past uh, have trouble differentiating between this as volume versus velocity. If you forget, here's what you do. Make your capital V's with little symbols over them like this for now. Okay, that's something that one of my professors did when he wanted the symbol of capital V. Because capital and lowercase v are very different, are very easy to uh, mix up when they're not written next to each other, right? They're not distinguishable. So if you didn't know that that was volume, put those little symbols there to indicate capital V. Now, we also have another capital V, though. What was the other capital V? That's lowercase for you guys. Capital V. It doesn't have to be funny. I, I, but I did just say lowercase V is velocity. What's the other capital V? There's another one. We just did it. Last chapter. Not current, not resistance, but voltage. Voltage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so take the mass over the density. We'll take 250 over 1250. That should be easy math. That's one fifth. Okay, that's one fifth. And we're looking at, in this case, cubic meters. That's the actual volume. I don't have to convert any units. Why? Why don't I have to convert any units in this problem? Yeah, kg cancels out. You got kg. Right, for, 12, for, for 250 in the numerator, right? That's right here. Over kg over m cubed. Kgs cancel. Now, please notice this, guys. I think by now, I'm hoping at least from your math course and from here, you've picked up on this. If something is in the denominator of the denominator, where is it really? In the numerator. And that's why meters cubed goes up with this answer. So see how these cancel here? This leaves behind 1 over meters cubed. When you divide by 1 over meters cubed, it's the same as multiplying by meters cubed, which is what puts it there. Besides the fact that you should know the units of volume should be meters cubed. How do you find volume of a rectangular solid from your math course in geometry? Length times width times base. Good, the length times width times height. It doesn't matter. Depth doesn't matter the word. But it's one dimension times another dimension times another dimension. How many dimensions are we talking about? Three dimensions, three dimensional world we live in. Hey look, meters cubed for volume. That's why it's meters cubed. Length is meters, width is meters, height is meters. You multiply all three of those. Now, to continue with the question that George asked, let's talk about buoyant force. Okay, and this is just like the normal force. When I'm standing here, when you're sitting there, you're not falling through the floor because of the normal force, the reactive force from the floor. Well, how many of you, show of hands, have been to a location where the water is so salty you can float? Like, easily. Do you remember what it was called? I forget the name, but it was... A lake somewhere, I'm yeah, sure, right? Really salty lake where the salt didn't come out of it. Yeah, you could, you could literally lay down in the water and you would float with no problem. The Dead Sea is one of those areas. The Dead Sea is known for its high salt content. Uh, it has to do with the area, the geographical region. But the high salt content increases the buoyant force so much, it makes the density of the water much greater, 
and as a result, resists you from sinking in it. It's like as if you were, it's almost as if you were laying on a flat surface with a normal force pushing up. Obviously, you're going to be submerged a little bit. But the buoyant force is so great because of the actual density that it pushes back up enough that you can lay there and not move. Now, if you're in a regular pool, you're not going to float naturally. You'll kind of sink a little bit. But don't you feel a little bit like you weigh less? Don't you feel like you weigh less when you're swimming in the water, right? That's called your apparent weight. That's your apparent weight. That is the difference between your weight and the buoyant force. Jot that down. And that's the apparent weight right there. Okay, put a little arrow from that. If you want to calculate the apparent weight of something, you need to find the difference between the weight acting down and the push back up. And the push back up. If the push back up is equal to your weight, you float. Think about it. If the water pushes back up with the same amount of force as the weight pushing down, you float on the surface. That's when you subtract these two, what would you get then? You would get zero, because what would you feel like you weighed? So you would naturally float. Like it all, all this stuff makes sense in this section. It's all very tangible. Very different than the electrical circuit system, right? Electricity, all that stuff was very theoretical. Okay, I saved this and heat for the last two because I find that a lot of students have a good experience with this because of the fact that it's everywhere around you in life. Fluid mechanics and thermal systems are everywhere. So in, a, in, in essence, all the stuff we're going to do, you can kind of relate to in some sense or another. Ernest, what's your question? I was waiting for you. Oh, is it possible that um, the answer you would get from that would be a negative? No, that's a great question, Ernest. Can it ever be negative? What would the, what would the significance of that be, right? It can't because the buoyant force can never be larger than the gravitational. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Okay, let me, let me start over. If you're held underwater by something, and then that something releases you, for an instant, while you're underwater still, the buoyant force is greater. Like, a, like, like here's a great example. See, you can relate to this. Uh, you know the volleyballs you play with in the pool? Yeah. The inflatable ones? Hold it under the water, let go, what happens? So for an instant while it's held under, the buoyant force is greater than the weight, so as a result, it would shoot out. But eventually, when it comes back down to the water, what would it do? It would float on the surface, right? It would remain sitting there. The buoyant force would be equal to the weight at that moment. So for an object, as time goes on, it will never be greater. But for an instant, if it's tethered underwater, yes, it could be. And that would cause a vertical acceleration upward. Here, that's a great question, actually. This is, this is great. So look, if we think about this here, if the buoyant force is greater, hypothetically, let's say it's like 60 newtons and the weight is only 40 newtons, that would be a net upward force of 20 newtons. Everybody sees that? We know that from equilibrium, from our net force diagrams. 60 newtons up, 40 newtons down. This here would be the net force upward of 20 newtons. A net force up would cause a net acceleration. So the object, the beach ball, would accelerate until it got to the surface, shoot out, land on the surface, and then sit there in equilibrium. So yes, you're right. You could have more buoyant force. You could have more buoyant force. And sometimes you'll even do this, by the way, because we're looking, if we're looking for the absolute value of the weight, the, the apparent weight is not really given with a sign usually. So it's really just the difference between these two. In our diagrams, though, when we look at F equals MA, the buoyant force acts up. So sometimes we'll have FB minus FG when we're looking at the overall diagram. But this is just the apparent weight right here. Again, this is only for the apparent weight. So let's put absolute value around that. That actually, Ernest, what you asked made me think about it. Put okay. absolute value. So thank you. OK, that should be around there. Uh, Archimedes principle, the next part, okay, is what we talked about already. But it helps us to develop our equation as well. So this is the idea. And you can take a look at the diagram. The water level starts at a certain value. It starts pretty much right up to where this spout wants to allow water to flow out. So if this brick or this object is lowered, the water level should rise, but it's going to pour out of the spout into this other container over here. So here's the water flowing out of the actual container, and then it's fully submerged in this diagram, and here's how much water has flowed out of the actual container. Okay, it's kind of hard to see. Maybe on your diagram, you should probably be able to see it pretty well. Now, the interesting part is this. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of this fluid. OK, 
Okay, that's the interesting part right here. The buoyant force acting on that brick is equal in this case to the weight of the fluid that has been displaced. Again, the weight of the fluid that has been displaced. Archimedes' principle helped us a lot mathematically. Okay, we're going to see this in a minute. And let's take a look at this. So, here's what we're saying. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid. Now, how do I find the weight of anything? If I want the weight of an object, I take what two things and multiply them? Quick, what's our formula from earlier in the year? Thank you, mass times gravity. What do you think the F stands for right now? Why am I putting that? Of the, thank you, mass of the fluid. Okay, because it's the weight of the fluid we're looking at. Now, real quick, mass is simply equal to density times volume. And you can get that from the formula earlier. Mass over volume. I'll give you like a two-second break to get a drink after this slide. Okay, so this is going to be the formula that we're going to end up using for the buoyant force right here. Okay, the density of a fluid times the volume of the fluid displaced times gravitational constant, 981. If the object is fully submerged, how much fluid is displaced? Whatever the volume of the object is. So if I take my hand and I put it under water, technically I could measure the volume of my hand by looking at how much fluid is displaced. If I take a brick and drop it in the water, the water level that rises should equal the volume of the actual brick. So VF might be VO if the object is fully submerged. Write that note down, please. Guys, this is the extra stuff I always talk about. VF is really VO if the object is fully submerged. The amount of fluid that is displaced in volume equals the volume of the object. And again, if it is fully submerged. So when you get on a boat, you're not looking at that scenario because that boat better not be fully submerged, right? So it's not going to be equal in that case. But certain things that would sink naturally would be equal. If you want like a two-minute break, take two Let's talk next about sinking versus floating. Let's talk about sinking versus floating. We've already really alluded to this several times, right? When you float, what do you know? Or when you sink, what do you know? Give me two, condi two conditions here. You're floating or equilibrium. Okay, so floating. You're in a state of equilibrium. I would agree with that because there's a what? When you're in equilibrium, there's automatically a what? What's the reason for equilibrium? A balance of forces, right? So in this case, this is when the buoyant force acting up is equal to the weight, the weight acting down. So if we're sinking, would you have a net force acting down? Good. Good. Net acts down. That's the key there. So in this case, the weight of an object is greater than the buoyant force. Yeah, those are pretty much our two scenarios that we have to consider. Um, now, if we take a look at this, we could also consider this, and we could look at our idea of buoyant force as a formula and recognize that the density plays a role here. The density itself plays a role. So when you were younger, when you were younger in like your intro science courses, you did learn about density quickly. And I think something that most students did was they would drop things into water and see if they either sank or floated. Yeah. FB, thank you. They would either sink or they would float. Uh, and in the case that we're looking at here, if something sank, what did you say when you were younger? You didn't really talk about the weight and the buoyant force always. You talked about density. What did you say about density if something sank? Yeah, you, you would say, well, it's more dense. It's more dense than what? Than the fluid it's in. Than water, in that case. Very good. You'd always drop it in water. And if you've done this before, you take a piece of wood in water, what happens? It floats. Well, not all. I shouldn't say wood in general. But most wood floats in water. Then you take something like metal and drop it in water, and it sinks naturally. If you've ever taken oil and water and put them together, what happens to that? Yeah, the oil sits at the top because it's less dense. There's actually a, and how many of you are going to take forensic science next year? There's an interesting thing in forensic science with density. You're going to see with, when you're looking at an unknown density of a fiber, you take a column of a fluid, of several different fluids that are, that are um, like, 
what is that called? The clouds have different strata. They're, what's the word for it? They're, uh, there's different layers. And each of the layers is a different amount of density. And where that unknown fiber settles out allows you to calculate its density. Because in reality, how are you going to calculate a density? Imagine taking one string off your shirt. Good luck calculating the density of that. How are you going to do it? Right? You're going to get the volume of that? How are you going to measure that? When you drop it in water, you're going to see any increase in height of a single strand? Can you get the mass of a single strand? Probably, actually, in a good lab, you could get the mass. But the easier way to do it is to drop that fiber into the fluid. And where it settles indicates the density. It settles in the oil versus settling in the water versus settling in whatever other fluid is. You look at the density of that fluid, and you know the, flu the density of the actual fiber itself. It settles out at that location. Okay, so like, are the capital located Yes, I'm just being crazy with my subscripts here. Sorry, Lauren, I didn't mean to confuse you. Yeah, either one, sorry. Why is that some wood flow? Why is it what? That some wood flow. Well, because it's just more dense. The actual wood, the, the, it's, it has to do with just the composition of the wood itself. When, when, it, when it grows, it must, I don't, I don't know, like I don't know the biology of wood, but I'm guessing it has to do with the moisture level of the wood. I mean, less moisture usually means more air pockets, so it would float naturally, more moisture usually means that it's like denser and has more fluid in it, and maybe even like sap has to do with it, I'm not sure. But it really just means that the density of certain wood is greater than water, while others is less than water. So if we're floating, we could say the density of the object itself is less than the density of the fluid. If it sinks, the density of the object is greater than the density of the fluid. Okay, these are just things that we need to know. These are things that we need to understand, these three points. Okay, that's literally what the difference is between sinking and floating as far as physics and mechanics is concerned. You guys know the difference in everyday life. You understand the concept because you've seen stuff float and seen stuff sink. But this is mathematically how we represent this. Okay, those two points. Okay, so this is really point one comes from equilibrium. This is point two. Again, point one coming from net force and then point two that we want to focus on. Now, what about, this is kind of tough to explain, what about that moment where, and you've done this before, some of you may have at some point, have you ever been underwater and you like blow out some air and you're kind of able to just sit there underwater? You're not sunk to the bottom, you're not at the top floating, but you can actually find a perfect state of equilibrium. Try it sometime if you have like a pool you can visit that has a deep end. Go into the deep end, don't, pop, please be careful obviously, okay? Like dive down a little bit, maybe like halfway to the bottom, blow out a couple of bubbles. And what will happen, if you don't blow out any bubbles, take a deep breath and try to get to the middle and don't, the idea is that you don't want to actually swim to hold yourself down like everybody. You could, you could push up on the water, which naturally pushes you down, and we all know that, you could stay there. But if you blow out a couple bubbles when you're like in between the, the bottom of, uh, of the pool and the surface of the water, you could sit there in the middle, kind of like in this state of equilibrium. And at that point in time, that's kind of like in between here. It's like a little combination. You're not floating, but you're not sunk, you're in between. That's the only time that the density of the object will equal the density of the fluid. And by you blowing out air, what are you doing? You're altering your density. Think about it for a second. You take in all this air, and you dive down into the water. You have a lot more volume right now because you're holding this air in, right? You have a lot of volume. So if you have a lot of volume, you have less density. That's why you want to get back up to the surface, naturally. But if you blow out some of the air in the form of bubbles, you're decreasing your volume which is increasing your density. By increasing your density, you're no longer coming back up to the top and floating, like you see here. Okay, you're no longer coming up to the top. You're, in essence, making your density equal to the density of the water that you're in. Okay, that's that in-between state. So if you want to even draw yourself a little diagram, that's when you're kind of like right here, okay? In the middle of the water. You're not at the bottom sunk, you're not at the top floating. You're just kind of standing there, and you're like floating. You're Floating. You're levitating in a sense. It is kind of, if you think about it, it is kind of like levitation, right? Think about that for a minute. It actually is kind of like levitation. Good. Uh, I don't get how a boat floats in water, but I think a human can float. So think about the inside of a boat. What is it comprised of mainly? Inside the hull. What is inside? The, anybody look inside the hull of a boat before? It's air. That's all it is. It's a giant air pocket. So inside the boat itself, there's an air pocket in the actual physical nature of it. But even where you're standing, you're in there, right? But around you, what's around you? It's air. 
in tomorrow's lab, we're going to have something where you guys have to design your own little boat and get it to float holding the most mass. So we'll talk about that, and you're going to see more about it. But it physically has to do with the volume of the boat being great, and what's inside of it is mainly air. It's mainly air. Now, the material has a lot to do with it also. Certain materials are very, very, very <coughs> low density, and those materials are used to construct boats. So it has to do with those two main things. If instead of air, it was like solid matter, it would probably be the same thing. Yeah, I mean, like, if you... Exactly. Like, Exactly. If you, if you remember, like, when you learn about Native Americans, they used to make canoes, and canoes were made out of wood. Wood is not dense, first of all. And what did they do? They hollowed it out, right? Which pretty much made it like an air chamber. Think about it. That's what it is. But if water starts coming into the canoe, it might sink. You never know. I mean, depending on the density of the wood, really. Okay, but the same with the boat. If a boat starts taking on water, what might happen to it eventually? It'll sink. Okay? The Titanic, when it hit an iceberg, the, underneath it, the hull, exploded inward, took on a ton of water. Over time, water kept increasing, which is increasing mass. Increase in mass increases density. Over time, the Titanic became more dense than the water it was in and sank. So you think about it, it's just a, it's just a very low density object. That's all boat is because of all the air that's trapped in it. Okay? It's a good question. Uh, we're going we're gonna to touch on that a lot more. Good? Well, guys, listen, what Lauren said is right. If you take an egg and want to test that it's good or not, you can put it in water and eggs naturally sink. Now, if the egg floats and something went wrong inside the egg, it's gotten rotten, or the egg has expired for too long, so it's not going to be something you want to eat, it will float. Now, do you know the reasoning for it? I mean, uh, now you probably do based on this lesson, or you should know the reason it floats, well, but what physically well, happens? Well, I want to ask him. Hey, ask, 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 ask. Uh, I'm guessing it makes it heavier. It makes it yeah. not heavier. Oh, like when it's egg like, Oh, because it, it rises. Yeah, so it makes it lighter. When the egg is run, it rises to the top. So it makes the egg lighter. Some sort of chemical or physical change going on. I don't know what it is. But it's probably something to do with releasing something through that membrane, possibly. Maybe some sort of gas. But anyway, the, the density somehow decreases and it'll float. So Anthony has salt, water, and an egg. Thoughts? Any ideas of what he's going to do? Yeah, he's literally going to start with the egg in the water. It's going to be completely at the bottom. It's going to be more dense than the actual water itself. But when you add salt to water, you're increasing the mass, right? Thus increasing the density of the water. Once the density of the water is greater than the egg, the egg will then float. We're going to look for, do you remember what I talked about? When the densities are exactly the same, what will happen? It'll be somewhere in the middle. So when Anthony starts to see, he's going to have to keep stirring it to get the salt to dissolve. When he starts to see the egg just float off the bottom, he'll call our attention so we can see it. And as he pours the rest of the salt, we'll see the egg just pop right up to the surface. It's very simple, the idea behind it. But does it make sense what's happening? It explains the concept of density really well. The egg is more dense, it sinks, it's equivalent in density, it kind of comes up to the surface, and then once the density of the water gets much greater than the egg, it just pops up to the top and floats. It's also analogous to the buoyant force. Less buoyant force until it rises up to the top and it has then more buoyant force. The egg's mass is not actually changing. This is not going to work. That's true, Jeffrey. You're supposed to open the spout. I was yeah. not sure where the spout was. So your goal would be you're going to be starting to the edge, just where it's like in the middle of the All right, so we're going to come back to this in a moment, okay? Let's go ahead to our slide. So let's go to the next thing. So these are what we were just talking about a minute ago, variable densities. Hey, how come a fish has a variable density? Why do you think a fish would have a variable density? Fish don't breathe in air, right? They have gills. They, they, they take the air out of the water. But why do they have a variable density? Because they have, um, it's, uh, their skeleton is not set. 
Okay, that's true also. It's a malleable membrane. The actual material in the skeleton can move a little bit, but what else? Why, why do you think evolution-wise they have a variable density? Well, I assume because, um, well, for example, like them swimming down, it's not, for us, it may be more difficult for us to swim down that they can change or to, you know, swim a different density. Yeah, if they want to swim down, what do they have to do? They need to increase their density to stay that low, don't they? But if they want to come to the surface, they want to be very, they want to be not dense at all. They want to have a low density in order to float. Remember, low density floats. So a lot of fish actually use this as a defense mechanism to move quickly from one elevation to the other. What's the fish that? Blowfish. The blowfish's biggest defense mechanism is, besides it looks kind of scary to other fish actually, is that when it increases in size suddenly, I don't know how it does that by the way, it's got to be something with its gills. When it does that suddenly, it takes on a lot of oxygen, it suddenly shoots up in, the, in elevation in the water. Different densities or different levels, yeah? Can you say that like anything that's a consumer also? Anything that's a consumer that consumes other things physically? Sure, absolutely. If you eat a piece of sandwich, what have you just done? You've probably increased your density a little bit. You've definitely increased your mass, right? You know that. If you, increase the, if you eat a sandwich, you increase your mass. But you might also increase your volume. So your density may not increase as much, but yes, it would have a variable density. Anything that really consumes another thing, variable density. Okay, so that's where humans are on there, liquids are on there, and then a hot air balloon is a great example. Why is a hot air balloon a great example? How does a hot air balloon work? How does it work physically? You push more air. No. You sure? No, I can't. Say. Somebody besides Matei, he's asking me questions. I've heard his voice now. All right, what do you think? Specifically, then? It's like hot air. Hot air. Hot air is very low density. So you pump hot air into the balloon, which is very low density. Suddenly, the overall apparatus, the hot air balloon, has a lower net density than the air around it. If that's the case, it starts to float. Literally floats into the air. Right now, if you could cause your density to be less than air, you'd be able to fly. Okay? Now, birds don't fly on that theory. They fly what's called lift force. We'll talk about that in the next section. But if you could theoretically decrease your density enough, you would suddenly start to float off the ground. Am I? Like you said that um, like hot air is less dense. Is that why it tends to rise? That's air? exactly right. That's where convective currents come from. If you've learned of a convection oven, a convection oven is the idea that the air is circulating. Usually the burners are on the bottom. It heats up the air at the bottom which rises to the top, the cold air at the top, falls to the bottom, heats it back up, and what do you get? You get a convective current or a convective flow. So if you look around the room right now, we talked about this earlier in the year, I think maybe in the other or this class, radiators, where are they? Because the hot air, naturally, cooler, cool, uh, air conditioners, where are they? Because cold air, what does it do? It falls down. So naturally, having these where they are creates natural, what's called forced convection. Force convection, um, simply based on the temperatures alone. Okay, the temperatures alone. Um, now, earlier we talked about things that are incompressible, but liquid can have a variable density based on certain things. What am I basing that on? Thing. You did this in your chemistry course. You heated up a substance, and you kept heating it up, and eventually it was able to absorb so much of a solute. It was incredible, right? The solvent. It's solvent is the liquid, the solute is the stuff you're putting in it. So you ever add salt to water or sugar to water, what happens? It dissolves right in, right? But eventually if you add enough salt or enough sugar, what's going to happen? It settles down the bottom. But in a certain instance, you can heat up water and it actually takes on more of it. What do you call that kind of a solution? There's a word for it. It has to do with the density of the solute in there. How much of that grains of sand, uh, salt or sugar in the actual fluid. Super, come on, chemistry, come on. Super saturated, super saturated solutions. Oh yeah. Oh. If something is unsaturated versus saturated, it has to do with how much of the solute is in the solvent. If you heat it up, you, there's an experiment, the traditional chemistry experiment, if you heat something up enough, and you keep adding sugar, adding salt to it, it keeps taking on more and more. And then, if you actually let it cool down and drop one more crystal of salt into it, it becomes a solid instantaneously. 
It solidifies. It's a really cool experiment. Okay? Um, and the idea is that you get up to a super saturated level that can only hold at a certain temperature. And then when you cool the temperature down, it's waiting for that little, that little push over the edge. When you drop one grain of salt or sand in, it becomes a solid, the entire thing. It's kind of a cool experiment. Is that like rock candy? It's usually how they make that kind of stuff, yeah, where they make a sudden, like, uh, a sudden gem or rock out of it. I think rock candy is just done that way with sugar. And then they throw one more grain of sugar in, and the whole thing solidifies, and they break it up into little pieces. And you could, you could probably YouTube this and see, see it happen. Um, but these are variable density. So liquid can be a variable density because if I add salt to it, I'm adding mass, right? Adding mass, adding mass. So by adding stuff to a liquid, you're increasing its density. Every time you add something to a liquid that dissolves more and more, you're increasing the net density. Let's take a look at these examples now. So we have two examples with fluids that can be a little bit tricky for math. These are what we really want to get through for the rest of the period today, these two examples. So the first one says, calculate the magnitude of, calculate the, magnitude of the actual weight, the buoyant force, and the apparent weight of a very small iron ball, like a ball bearing. If you've ever seen like BBs before, you know what a BB is? You know a BB gun? Those you know, small metal spheres? Okay, this is like a BB right here. This is the, the volume of a BB. So this BB is made up of iron, and it's sitting in mercury. First, we're going to need these values, right? So we're going to have to look these up in a table. Your book has a table of values of many, many densities of different materials. If you're given a problem in homework and you don't know the density, what can you do, hopefully? Just look it up in the textbook or just Google it, honestly. Either one's fine. But the units of density that we are using in this chapter or in this class, the units of density are kilograms per cubic meter. So if you get a unit of density in, in um, grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter, please convert it. Okay, if you look it up on, on Google or something instead of your text. So those are units of density. Um, now it says that it's floating at rest on mercury. So what can we conclude immediately? What can we conclude immediately if it's floating at rest on the surface of the mercury? Okay, it's in a state of equilibrium. Good. What else? Second thing we can include, there's two things. George, what else? I don't know the density of iron or mercury, but Amaya? Good. The density of iron will be less than the density of mercury. Why is that? Because it's floating. If it's floating, its density must be less than the fluid it's sitting in. Well, it's sitting in mercury and it's floating, so the density of solid iron must be less than liquid mercury. It just has to be. Look it up now, you know what I mean? If you don't believe it, look it up, but it's true. It's gotta happen that way. So it turns out that the density of liquid mercury, I'm gonna call that the fluid. So actually, let me do this if you don't mind, guys, real quick. Instead of having I and M, let's use the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid, because we're going to use those in our formulas also. Okay, but the object is iron and the fluid is mercury here. So we can write down our givens. The density of solid iron turns out to be 500. The density of liquid mercury turns out to be 1025. Okay, those are our values that we are given. And it's not given in the problem, but those come from a table that you can look up on your own time. Okay? Now, the volume of the object is given. Let's make sure that we understand that this is the volume of the object, not the volume of the fluid. That's the volume of the object only. Oh, hold on, guys. I think I gave you the densities from the next problem instead, accidentally. Yeah, I gave you the densities in the next one where we had the two. I was looking at the same page. The object should be 7860. I apologize. Just correct this. This should be 7860. And the fluid should be 13,600. Still, the idea, obviously, is true that the fluid has to have greater density than the object for it to actually float. All right, 7860, 13,600, sorry. 
Now, if we look at this problem and we recognize here that the actual object is floating, we notice right away that this is the case, right? FB has to equal FG. Why is that important to us in this problem? Why is it important that FB equals FG? What can I do with that? What is FG? What is FG really? What is FB? What can I do with those, those values, those things? We, we are proving that, yes, but what can I use this equation to solve for? What are we looking for here? We're trying to find a couple things, aren't we? We're trying to find a couple things. We need to know actual weight of the object, the buoyant force. So looking at this one here, we have formulas for these, right? Let's plug in to start. So we can start plugging in here. Let's start with, for the object itself, so let's take this formula down here and rewrite it so we know where we're going with. The buoyant force is the density times the volume times gravity. The weight itself here would be the mass of the object times gravity. Which of these two values am I certain of? Which of these do I know? Which do I not know here? No, um, density of object. How, how can we do this with this side? Why can't I do anything over here yet? What's unknown about this? What subscript should I put that would tell me that I don't know anything yet about this side? I know the density of the fluid, right? We know here's our formula, sorry, fluid and fluid. We know the density of the fluid. We don't know how much of the fluid has been displaced because it says that this ball bearing is resting on the surface. So if you were to visualize this, here's the surface of the liquid, here's the ball bearing. Is it either A, sitting like this, B, sitting like this, or C, sitting like this, right? Which way is it sitting? Is it physically more out of the water? Is it evenly in the water and out of the water? Or is more of it submerged? These are the three scenarios that are possible for floating. It could be floating more out of the water, evenly, or more in the water, right? But we don't know VF. Remember, VF is how much of the object is submerged. Either this is VF right here, I'm coloring in, or this is VF right here, or this is VF right here. Remember, VF is the volume of the fluid displaced. That's how much object that's how much of the object is actually submerged under the water itself. So the blue shaded in region represents the volume of the fluid displaced, but we don't know. Has it been displaced fully, halfway, or not at all, or some? So we need to figure this out mathematically. So we can't utilize this. I don't know the left-hand side of this equation, but I do know the right-hand side. Now, earlier in the problem, we were asked to find three things, right? We were asked to find the actual weight, the buoyant force, and the apparent weight to start. What is this right here, the right-hand side? Is this, is this the actual weight, the buoyant force, or the apparent weight? Actual weight, buoyant force, or apparent weight? The this is the actual weight. How do you know? Look up. You go up one line, up the other line, up. There's the actual weight right there. FG is the actual weight. So we can start by calculating this value. We can easily do that. The density of the object, oops, 7860, times the volume of the object that was given, times gravity. That will give us the actual weight of the object. Multiply those three numbers, we'll get the actual weight. I'm doing this in steps for a reason. I know that you know we could plug in for row f, we could plug in for g, and a lot of you are going to recognize we can solve for this v. Okay, but for now, just calculate that. What do we get for an answer from that? The actual weight. Go ahead. Good. Three point eight six. If you round or eight five. Okay. So the actual weight is three point eight six. That's the first question that is asked. The second question that's asked is, what is the buoyant force? What's your answer? 
What's your answer? 3.86. Why? The object is floating. If my weight is 150 pounds, 200 pounds, and I'm laying in water and floating, the buoyant force better be 150 or 200 pounds to hold me up. It's got to be. It's a state of equilibrium. So although we just calculated the actual weight, this also tells us the buoyant force. Well, we know that because of here. Look back up, please. We wrote this to start. When an object is floating, we're in equilibrium. The buoyant force is equal to the actual weight. So what's your apparent weight? What do you feel like you weigh when you're floating? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, so these next two answers we didn't have to do any work for. That's why it stopped here. So here's the actual weight. Okay, the buoyant force is also 3.86 because it has to balance the actual weight. What is your apparent weight? It is zero. Those are the first three questions right there. The actual weight of the object, since it's in floating, a state of equilibrium is floating equal buoyant force, it apparently feels like it's not weighing anything at all. Now, I paused up here, look back at this line right here I'm pointing to now. Recognize that we know the density of the fluid and we know what gravity is. So we could solve for the volume of the fluid that's displaced, Vf, just by looking at this formula still. So although this gave us the actual weight, we have to continue using this formula, carry it down, plug in for the density of the fluid, which is 13,600 from up here. Gravity is 9.81, and we could solve for Vf. So divide by 13,600, divide by 9.81, or just divide by the product of those two together. You'll get the volume of the fluid displaced. That will be 2.9 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay, the actual volume was 5 times 10 to the negative 5. This is 2.9 times 10 to the negative 5. And the question asked us, how much of the ball's volume is actually floating? So what do I have to do with these two numbers? I'm trying to figure out how much the object is floating. This tells us how much fluid is displaced or how much has been submerged. I want to know how much is floating. So what do I do with those two values? Not add them, subtract them. Okay. So this is the total volume right up here of the actual object. This here is what's in blue. See in the, blue, in the diagram up here, look back up here if you need to. See what's in blue. So we're probably at this scenario, really, because almost a little more than half of it is, is uh, submerged. Out of the five, 2.9 is submerged. So if I subtract, I take this number here, the total volume of the object, minus how much of it is underwater, subtract those two, we'll get 2.1 times 10 to the negative 5 cubic meters. That's how much is floating. This is the volume of the object that is floating. Okay, this again is the amount that is submerged. Remember that the value of Vf is the volume of the fluid that has been displaced. The volume of the fluid, those don't even look like big Vs, I'll do this. Okay, the volume of the fluid displaced here. If that much has been displaced, it means that that much of the object is really submerged, take this away from the total volume of the object, you get how much is actually floating. Okay, this is just subtraction. This minus this gives us this right here at the end. Guys, this is a longer problem. It involves several steps, but recognize, please, that two of your answers here involved no math at all. Once you found the actual weight, this answer was equivalent because it's floating. This answer was zero, again, because it's floating. You feel like you weigh nothing. So these two answers here involve no math. It was the beginning that was a little bit trickier. Okay, but notice how we used one of our scenarios of floating versus sinking. Okay, recognize that we used that. That was quick. So with example three, we see the following. We've got an object with a density that's greater than solid water. Okay, it's dropped into the ocean. If the density is greater than salt water and it's dropped into the ocean, what do you think is going to happen to it? Everybody, it's going to? Thank you. It's not a trick question. 
with confidence. Like we're at church when everybody's like afraid to respond. Or, wait, should I stand up? Is this the right time to stand up? You all know what I'm talking about, so don't mind. You see the half stand-ups, everybody knows? It's like, stand up with confidence and everybody else in the house will stand up. Like, almost need one person to do it first. It's definitely going to sink. The density is greater than salt water. When density is greater than something, it sinks. If it's less, it floats. So it definitely sinks. It's then anchored to the bottom. It is then inflated. Think of a balloon of some sort, causing its density to decrease to a value less than salt water. So what does it want to do now? Which is, what the word that? It wants to rise or float. It wants to float. But it's anchored down now. So here's what we've got. Visually, object is brought to the bottom, chained to the bottom. It's then inflated. This is an object, not a person. Don't get weird ideas. The object is inflated to a volume of this size. It is still chained down. Okay? Nothing has changed. It wants to float, but it cannot. So what do you know is in the, in the chain link? What force? The force of? There it is. Very good. What do you use the old stuff from this year? Good. The force of tension. Again, it is more dense. It sinks. We chain it down to the bottom. You inflate it, which makes it want to float. But since it's chained to the bottom, it is still there. It is now the red shape. Ernest, what's up? The red shape is the opposite. Is the current shape right now. It started as this smaller shape. It then expanded. I'm showing that with the red shape. What is the force of tension if the density of the object after it's been inflated is 500 kilograms per cubic meter and its volume is given as 20 cubic meters? Let's list our known graph of that. So can you give me the variables, please, that we know? What are the variables that we know right away? We're in salt water. So what can we figure out if we look it up for salt water? What can we look up? It's, thank you. The density of salt water turns out to be, after looking up, 1025 kilograms per cubic meter. Why am I putting F? F stands for fluid. The density of the object after it's been inflated is, is, Ernest? Good. 500 kilograms per cubic meter. Kilograms per cubic meter. Okay? Like in, in, when you measure tire pressure, you measure uh, pounds per square inch. Instead of square inch, this is a cubic meter. Cubic meter measures volume. Kilogram measures mass. Mass over volume, right? Density? So we've got the density of the object and the fluid. We know the volume of the object is 20 cubic meters. I've got a question for you. If it's fully submerged, which it is, we know that. Here's the water level. Let's draw the water in, please. If it's fully submerged, what is the volume of the fluid displaced? What is the volume of the fluid displaced? Think about it for a minute. I see the same two hands. Both of you got it. I could know. What is the volume of the fluid that has been displaced by this object? How much did the water level rise by dropping this object in? If it's fully submerged, there's a quick, easy answer. It's a quick, easy answer. All right, still kind of the same other two hands, the same four mainly. Come on, others, think about this. You take your hand, you put it in the water, the water level rises. What is the water level rising? What is it really measuring? When the water level rises, it's measuring. What is it measuring? Yeah, so the volume of the object is 20 cubic meters. So what's the volume of the fluid displaced? 20 cubic meters, okay? It's kind of like a, one of those intuitive yet trick questions in a sense. These are the same values. These are the same values. The volume of the fluid that has been pushed aside is equal to the volume of the object whenever it's fully submerged. Write that note again. You read it more than once, believe it or not. You did this already once. Write it again, please. Because only four people picked up on it after about a minute of thinking. You're on the test. Let me explain this for one second. You're on the test. You can't take more than a minute to come up with that conclusion. Or else now this problem is going to take you ten minutes if you do that for every step, right? So this needs to be intuitive. If it's fully submerged, VF is VO. Because it's the same thing. The amount of fluid that's been pushed aside literally is the amount of the volume of that object itself. Okay. 
That's exactly what, thank you, I should have used that earlier, Jane, I apologize. Guys, this is the graduated cylinder experiment. You take a rock and drop it in, how much does the water go up? That's equal to the volume of the rock, right? Here, how much does the water go up? That's what the F is. How much is the volume of the object? And the same thing as how much the water goes up. Thank you, Jake. I should, I'll use that for now. Did you use that in chemistry? The graduated cylinder where you talk about volume displacement? Is it chemistry or like just science in middle school? Both. Both? Okay, I don't, I don't know. I'm honestly asking, so I don't know where. So you said only the quantities for the use of mirrors, it's V F is equal to V F. Correct. Because the volume of the fluid that's risen or been pushed aside comes from the object itself. So they have to be equal to each other. Now, this is the information we're given, yet we're looking for F T. Can somebody help me out with a free body diagram? Here's our object. What always pulls down? Everybody, what always pulls down? F G. In this case, what causes this object to want to move up to the surface? Ah, thank you. This is FG. Please draw FG right here. What is an arrow up or causes this object to want to rise? What force causes it to want to rise? Come on. Buoyant force. This should be everybody, guys. This topic is about buoyancy. I know that the buoyant force is greater. Look at the length of that arrow. Ah, Jesus. All right, give us a minute, guys. Can yeah, you ready almost, or is it still so, so, so as well? Yeah, I'm still as well. Okay. Give it a sec, guys. The airplane's down here. Draw an arrow upward, please. Make it longer than this arrow downward, and label it FB for force due to buoyancy. Why do I know the buoyant force is greater than the weight? Answer that question for me. Why do I know the buoyant force is greater than the weight? Come on, you can figure it out. Okay, because the tension is there, which is a result of that. Correct, that's part of it. Another explanation could be. Yeah, this object to rise up has to pass equilibrium. If it was equal to FG, it would be in a state of equilibrium. What else? Keep going. When the object's density is less than the fluid, what does it want to do? Rise up. To rise up, you need an imbalance of force. You need FB pointing up to be longer than FG pointing down to cause a net force in the upward direction. I'm going to try to reconnect to airplane. I'm going to pause for a second. All right. So that's our net force, obviously. So what keeps this object tethered to the ground, though? What do we say? Physically. The change. What force is that again? What is it? Tension. Guys, come on. Right away, you should all answer that. Tension. So we can draw FT acting down. It's hard to draw it at the same line. So you can draw kind of a little bit of an angle, but they're both acting directly down. There's no angle there. You could actually draw it over the other one if you have colors, which you guys actually do. Okay, so if you wanted to, you could draw one arrow over the other, showing that there's two arrows pointing down like that. Okay? So if I draw my, if I write my equation of motion, I know that this is in a state of what right now? It's not moving, right? It's tethered. Equilibrium. Equilibrium. So I could say the sum of the forces in the y direction equals ma. See what I'm doing here, guys? I'm using chapter 4 with fluids. I know that the buoyant force is part of this problem. It's not the only part. You've got gravity and the tension. So I've got FB acting up, FT acting down, FG acting down. Is it moving? So is there any acceleration? not moving, the acceleration doesn't even exist in this problem. There's no acceleration. It makes life a little bit easy on us because we would need the mass then and that gets a little bit messy. But it turns out we're still going to need the mass at some point. Buoyant force formula. And it takes a lot of salt, by the way. So if you're going lightly, feel free to just like douse it. You're going to have accumulation of salt. It's going to be really super saturated. All right. You're going to have like salt on the bottom. Kind of. right. That's why I was saying you might want a taller beaker. If it comes to the point where it's not moving, get a taller beaker. Don't get rid of the water. Pour it all in there so it still is already, you know, okay. saturated. Is it, um, P, uh, P, uh, Very good. That's our formula. If you didn't know that, where do you find it? Come on, on the formula sheet. Everybody should answer that. FT is unknown. That's what we're looking for. What's the formula for weight? The formula for weight, always. 
mg. I'm going to put an O here for object, and I'm going to explain again why I do that. Because I don't have the mass of the object, but I have its density and volume. Somebody tell me, what is the mass of an object in terms of its density and volume? And use this side node right here. What is the mass of an object if you solve for it in terms of its density and volume? Use the little side node in red. Matei? Good. So I'm going to replace this with density times volume. And the rest carries down. All right, perfect. So let's pause real quick. Let's pause this problem. Okay, we're at the exact spot we want to be where we're going to solve in a minute, in a, in a moment. Oh, nice. So take a look over. Let's take a look over. So it's kind of in the middle. It almost went almost to the surface. Now, if you keep adding salt, it'll probably get you, get you further out of the surface. But you can see here now that if you push it down, it's kind of at the point where it just started to float upward. So at this moment, the salt, the salt water became a tiny bit more dense than the actual egg. Again, the egg's density is not changing. There's no uh, osmosis, there's no cellular membrane that there's something transmitting through. It's the actual salinity of the water or its density. If you put an egg in the ocean, it just water. I don't know. I don't know if salt water is. Check. Check the density of an egg. Just literally Google density of an egg and Google density of salt water. If the egg has less density than salt water, it'll float. Ocean salt water is 1025. Yeah, keep adding salt. Let's see if you can actually get it to like really push out the surface. Yeah. Because we're given that above. Look up here. Guys, everybody focus, please. Look up. We're given the volume of the object. We're given the density of the object. So I'd rather use those two things because I don't have the mass of the object. I don't have it, right? So if I look at this formula right here and I multiply by V, I get rho times V equals M which is right here. So replace M with rho V. So I replace this M right here with rho V. Okay, it's equivalent expression. At this point, we know everything in this formula except for FT. We can move everything over or just move FT over, which is easier. I'm just going to move FT over. So add FT, guys, focus on. Add FT over to the right hand side, and then simply plug in to get FT. Everything is given in this problem. Salt water, 1025. Volume, 20. Gravity could even be factored out if you wanted to. We're going to write it twice here, but you could have factored it out front. It's not going to, it's not going to go away, but you could have factored it out front when you're multiplying to make it easier. The density of the object was 500 after it was inflated. The volume of the object is the same. That could have been factored out also. So 20 times 9.81 could have been factored out of this and placed in front before calculating. Here's what I'm saying. Oops. This is what it could have looked like. Take a look, please, because this has a lot of significance. Look, volume is the same. So what's really the, the factor that's causing this tension, the difference between objects and the fluids? Density, which makes sense. We said a moment ago, density is what causes buoyancy. So the buoyant force is a result of that. So this subtraction here is the, pro is the part that gives tension. If the densities were exactly the same, what does this number become? Everybody, what does this become if the density of the object in the water would sink? Zero. So what would the tension in the chain be? Zero. Because there wouldn't be any buoyant force. It's the egg that's in between. It's the egg that's kind of in, in tandem, somewhere floating in between sinking and floating. Okay? Between sinking and floating. All right? A tough problem for sure. That's why, if you guys notice, I put section 12E. We're going to do an extra section with just more math problems to practice these more. So instead of introducing a, th a third section, I'm only going to do 12.2 and 12.3, and then we're going to spend a whole class period doing more of these kinds of problems. Because okay, they're not easy. 
It involves a lot. It involves your equations of motion from earlier in the year, Newton's law right here, and then free body diagrams, and then a lot of stuff. Plugging in for this formula, recognizing this formula, replacing mass with density times volume, and then plugging in all those numbers. What do you get as a, as a tension? Before I take that question, what do you get as a tension here? Oh, yeah, go for it. Okay, that's how much tension is in the actual chain link. Think about this. This is a perfect application. What is this really? What is this really an example of, in a sense? You model it as a, for those that boat, come on, or boat, for those that sail. For those that sail, what is it an example of? Similar to an anchor. Similar to an anchor. An anchor with tension in it, that's a perfect example, that works. But something even better that's really exactly what this is. That's what an anchor is. No, no. Can you tie it to the dock? Same thing as an anchor, though, right? Come on. I like the, like the idea it looks like it's an anchor. Come on, when you navigate, what do you use to navigate near the dock? What do you see all over the place? What do you call them? Buoys for buoyant force, right? Aren't buoys tethered down? Guys, they got to be tethered down. They don't just magically not move with the ocean. Buoys are tethered down. This is a buoy. That's all it is. It just happens to be something that floats instead of sinks. A buoy has to be tethered down, though. So there's tension in that cable, in that buoy. When, they, when the weight pulls it, there's enough tension because of the force of the water, that this is force pulling the buoy as it moves past it, it creates tension in the cable. This is the exact same model as a buoy. It's the little orange things in the water. They flow. It's, like, it's pretty much like a lane. They create lanes to travel. When you're bringing your boat back into the dock, you follow the buoys and stay to the right. It's a lane. Hey, take a quick look. So notice right away now, earlier, please look, earlier with the egg, we forced it down and let go and it slowly moved to the surface, right? There was very little acceleration because there was only a small balance of force. The point of force was a little bit greater than the weight. But now when we let go, oops, now when we let go, it actually moves up rather quickly compared to what it did a moment ago. So what has increased just now is the actual acceleration that increased. The actual, the actual acceleration increase because there's more buoyant force. Go back to your free body diagram, everybody, please. This is great that we're doing it with this problem. Look at the free body diagram. For the egg right now, there's no tension, right? Everybody see that? The tension isn't there. This is the free body diagram for the egg. As Anthony kept adding salt water, it kept increasing the density of the fluid. Everybody look, this is, this is like the gist of everything here. The density of the fluid kept going up as he added salt, added salt to the water, which kept increasing the buoyant force. As the buoyant force got greater and greater, there was more of a net force upward, more of an imbalance of force. More force creates more acceleration. That's why the egg moved up faster just now than it did earlier. And then it did earlier. Does that make sense? Any general idea of okay, what you're seeing with the egg? Questions? All right. Good, good. Let's talk about pressure real quick. So, the simple idea of pressure, how many of you have stood on one foot before when doing some sort of a stretch, what happens right away? You wobble a little bit, right? You're increasing the pressure. The weight that each leg currently holds is equal to half of your body weight. Agree with that fact? Each leg supports half of your body. What happens when you do this now? All your weight is on one leg. Look at the formula. Weight comes from a force, right? If you increase the force, what are you also increasing? The pressure. They are directly related. What does A stand for? A stands for? Area. And you can tell by the units. Look at the units. That's, oh my, that's fine. I thought you said area first. That's why I called it. Meters squared. Units of meters squared means meters times meters. That's an area. It's a rectangle. It's an area. Okay, so this is force over area. If I suddenly do this, I'm putting all the weight on one leg. I'm also inherently decreasing the area. Think about that. 
And I'm really increasing the force and decreasing the area inherently a little bit of both there by doing that. If you pop a balloon, would it work if I took a pencil and I took the eraser end of a pencil and went like this to a balloon? Is it going to pop? The eraser end will pop. No. Because it has a generally decent sized area that's not very sharp. But if I take a pin, what have I done to the area, everybody? The area of contact between the pin and the balloon, is it very easy? So if I made it really small, what am I increasing? If I decrease the area, I'm increasing the pressure. You pop a balloon because you're decreasing the area of contact. That's how it works. Think about it. A pencil point works too, doesn't it? Because it has a very small area. But the end of an eraser, isn't that area much larger? The area of contact? That's why. You think it's like, oh, it's sharper. A reduction of area is what causes sharpness. Think about that for a second. Reduce the area, it gets to be very pointy. That's what makes it sharp, really. So a reduction of area increases pressure. There's no way like, you can put a balloon on like a bunch of things and it won't pop. If you put, if you're interested, a little, little plug for this, in the next month or so, I'm going to uh, offer up a future for physics. I get bonus points, so if you come and get bonus points on a test, feel free to. It's not expensive, I think it's like 30, 30 bucks a ticket or 40 bucks maybe. We meet in Midtown, it's called That's, That Physics Show. It's an all Broadway show, and the entire, it's like a one hour performance. It's geared for like 8th to 12th grade. So you're going to have like middle schoolers there, to be honest. It goes with very simple physics, kind of like what you were talking about with displacement of area, to stuff that's a little bit more advanced, like, like uh, electricity and magnetism, stuff that we've actually covered with electricity. Um, anyway, they do that in the performance. One of the things is like when the person lays on a uh, bed of nails, all you're doing is increasing the contact area. Every nail that you're laying on is that much more area, right? So you're taking the weight of the body, and you would step on one nail, what's going to happen? It's going to go right through your foot, because the weight is enough, and it's a small enough area. If you have 400 nails now, every nail gets one four hundredth of your weight. Oh, you know what? Even if you, say you weigh, as, a, as an average male, 200 pounds, I don't know if that's average. But say you weigh 200 pounds, that means every nail gets a half pound. It's really not that much. You're not going to break through that. So the demonstrator that does it gets on there, and you know what he does? He puts another bed of nails on top of him and has a kid stand on top. And nothing happens to this guy. It's freaky as hell. And honestly, I don't think I'd ever try it. I really don't think I would. But it works, believe it or not. It's crazy. And it's all because of pressure. Ernest, you have a question also. I was going to say, so like maybe something with a knife is because of how small it Yeah. When you sharpen a knife to a point, it's that area that's so tiny that any little force you push down creates a lot of pressure. Pressure is what cuts the food. Isn't that crazy to think about it? The force helps, but it's the force that causes the pressure because of the really, really small, small, small edge. Um, you could just dump it for now. Um, even the egg we can toss, but I don't want it to be cracked, so maybe try to find, find a way to put like some cushioning around it before throwing it out so it doesn't stink later. Rather not ever. Actually, put it in the hallway one too. Uh, is that going to be? Put it in the hallway, but don't put, put something around it to kind of cushion it. Okay. There's, there's some paper over there to cushion right there. Uh, so hey, think about this for a second. We just talked about pressure, right? Everything has mass to it. If something has mass, it has weight. The air around you is a fluid. Let's go back and think. I need you guys to focus. Too many of you are like intently looking at your iPads right now. I'm on the next slide, even though AirPlay is not working. Go to this next slide, please, right here. OK? Oh, thank you. When you're standing here, you are actually standing in a fluid right now. Gases and liquids are fluids. All fluids have density. So there's actually some density. There's some weight pulling down on you. When you get in the water, the reason you stay at the bottom if you blow out the air is because the water density, the water on top of you, sorry, is pushing down on you creating even more pressure. Your weight is helping you stay down also. Buoyancy is pushing back up. But when you're physically standing still in the air, there's actually pressure pushing down on you. And that's called atmospheric pressure. So there's physically weight on your body. If you were to go to space where there's no longer any weight acting down on you, there's an article that we see in the New York Times about all this. Um, you would feel very different. A lot of things change about your body. People that spend like months and months at a time in space, a lot of things that change are like tough on the body when they come back to it. Because you're going from gravitational fields where the weight of the atmosphere pushes down on you, where your body pulls down on you, 
So something in space where there's no atmosphere, there's no weight in your body, suddenly your body has no stress. So I always joke with the juniors and say, if you ever stress out, here's your excuse. Right? You have the weight of the world on your shoulders. Literally, you have the atmosphere weighing down on you right now with a lot of pressure, believe it or not. Your body evolution has just allowed us to exist in this habitat, in this state of pressure of 100, it's 101.3 kilopascals, or 1 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Ernest. So, this is the way that we did it, but it was in space in the space. Your body would adapt to space over so time. Yeah, uh, oh, I don't even know about that. It's a great question. You probably would gain some sort of height compared to what you would be under the normal gravitational pull and atmospheric pressure. I don't know if it would be significant. I'm not sure. Pollution. And we need to know enough data to know. Yeah. 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 And then also, like, like it's huge right now. So, I mean, that the atmospheric pressure is different now. I would guess yes. But it makes sense. Like, like because think about it. The salt water, we added salt, it got more dense, right? Yeah. In the air, is there water in the air when it's foggy? Yeah. When it's humid? Yeah. So it should be heavier air. So physically, maybe that's why you feel that way on like a dreary day when you feel like, uh. Maybe it's just the atmosphere pulling down on you right now. Maybe it's that moisture in the air weighing down on you. Um, yeah. Does your bone density change I don't know if the effects of space are that significant to change that. Honestly, I didn't read the article yet, but I did tab it. So it's over on my phone right now. It's that, maybe I'll look at it later. But there's a new article, I think it was New York Times, that just came out that said, you know what? We can look at all these things and measure them relative to what people look like on the earth and compare those values. And that's probably what they're doing when they're talking about the I didn't get a chance to read it. Okay? All right, let's go to the next slide. And by the way, let me introduce this, by the way. I didn't mention this earlier. This is the units of pressure. The guy's name is Pascal. I did. I mentioned it, but I didn't, I didn't use the guy's name or anything, so you know where it came from. The scientist that really coined pressure and the idea of pressure, his last name was Pascal. These are the units of pressure. They are equal to newtons over square meters. That is equal to Pascal. A Pascal, just like watts or joules per second, this is Pascal, newtons per meter squared. Which makes sense. It's a force in newtons over an area in meters squared. A simple principle to start with from Pascal simply tells us that if you have a closed container and you somehow have pressure applied to it, it gets transmitted equally at every point in the fluid. And this is really interesting. This is why, how many of you have ever seen those big water drums on the side of a highway when you're driving like cross country? In like, especially like the Midwest and places where water is stored in these big containers. Even in New York it is also, but it's not even a city. You're like an egg. Okay. Yeah, you're like an egg. So you see these big cylindrical drums. And some of them aren't dwarfs. Some of them are like uh, grain, other things that are near farms. The reason they don't burst at the bottom, you think like all the weight is pushing down, right? If there's a closed container with an equal amount of weight, or not equal weight, but a certain amount of weight that's filling it, the pressure is transmitted equally throughout that container at all points on the wall. So there's never like a fixed or concentrated stress. And that's what Pascal's principle actually tells us. So we're talking about a container like this that is filled and is closed, meaning is sealed. These containers are not open to the environment. The actual pressure that is applied due to the object inside, whether it be fluid like water or some sort of other material, is equally transmitted throughout. Now, that also goes for if you apply pressure from the outside. Okay, usually now, if you apply enough pressure in one area, what'll happen? What'll happen to that? If you take a gun and shoot a bullet at it, what'll happen? It'll puncture, right? It'll actually go through the wall. It'll exceed the allowable stress limit of that material. That's really what is happening engineering-wise. There's a certain amount of structural integrity you would measure, and it's usually like the modulus of elasticity is the word, how much you can bend or flex, you would probably puncture it. Does enough pressure apply? But if you were to hold a can of soda in your hand, try and break the can of soda, I dare you. I guarantee none of you can do it. If you, if, do you think you can apply enough pressure to cause a can of soda to just burst to the top with your hand? No. Most likely not. If you put it on the ground and stop on it, or if you take 
a fork, and you go like this with it to, to, to take a fork to the side of the can, it might puncture, right? Because the pressure is really increased in that location because of the small area. The same thing, believe it or not, for the can goes for an egg. True. No, no lie at all. Take an egg, put it in your hand, hold it. Actually, the egg's still over there, but the egg's going out. Take an egg, hold it the long way, this way, in your hand, grip your hand around it so that your thumb is around it so that you can, tr can try to equally apply pressure. If you honestly take one finger and apply pressure with only one finger, it's going to break. The theory is that if you apply pressure equally, it is equally transmitted back from the fluid. So if you try to take an egg, put it in your hand and squeeze it as hard as you can, you're going to sink. Okay? If you do it in a way that your hand and your thumb and all these fingers kind of equally apply pressure, see how I'm separating like that, like this, and hold the egg? Not maybe like this, because then all the pressure is in one spot. Separate your fingers like this, and try to crush the egg in your hand, and it won't crush. Okay, I'm not lying, it's not gonna break. Try it yourself and go home. You'll literally see that when you do that, nothing will happen. Anyhow, that's what Pascal's principle is telling us that the pressure applied to a closed container from the inside and outside is equally transmitted to the walls of that container. So yes. this is basically like a water bottle. And explain how to put out a water bottle where it's closed. A closed water bottle, yeah, exactly. Bottle. That's why when you get a case of water from a Costco or from the supermarket, those water bottles haven't exploded. They get under a lot of stress. When you pick them up, there's a lot of pressure applied to those containers. It's being equally transmitted to all the wall parts of the, or all the, parts of the wall of the container. So like, this is why shotgunning when your beer is something works, right? <laughs> so the hydraulic lift. <laughs> the hydraulic lift. The idea here is that you can you can use Pascal's principle and apply it to mechanics. So you go to the, you go to the mechanic and he says, all right, I got to put the car up on the lift. And you're like, the lift? What's the lift? It's called the lift. It's a hydraulic lift. This container is fixed. Take a look at it. See the green fluid, it's called hydraulic fluid. On the right side, you have a very, very small cross-sectional area over here. Very small cross-sectional area. On the left side, a very large cross-sectional area. What's interesting is that I can apply a very small force and lift the weight of a car using simply hydraulics. This is what hydraulics work on. Now, let me explain. We said earlier that due to Pascal's principle, the pressure to every wall is the same. So start with that fact. The pressure at location two, where the car is, is the same as the pressure at location one, where the person pushing down is. Physically, a person could actually do this. Now, pressure is defined as force over area. Ah, this should be area one. It's, a, it's, uh, it's activities, give me maybe 30 more seconds, okay? Now, here's what I want you to recognize. F2 is the actual car, right? F2 is the actual car physically. F1 is the force you're going to apply. So let's solve for the force F1 that we're gonna apply. How do I get rid of A1? Multiply by A1 on both sides, it cancels. So I end up with the fact that F1 is equal to this, and write it this way. I'm gonna show you what I mean. This is what F1 equals, and let me discuss for about another 10 seconds or so. So take a look up. F1 is equal to a fraction of F2. Because a minute ago, I told you that the area where you push down is smaller than the area where the car is. So think of any number. Make believe the area you push down on is 1 and the car area is 10. This physically tells me now that I need to apply a force that is one-tenth of the weight of the car. Okay, let that sink in your mind for a minute. The force I need to apply is one-tenth of the weight of the car if my area is one-tenth of the area of the car.